Coogie Jackson's story, Flight from Georgia, starting on page 130. It's my pa's story, but he don't tell it often because he figures no one would believe him. The truth is hard to swallow sometimes. Anyway, Gladiola is a good 500 miles from Sassafras Springs as the crow flies. Pi says even a crow couldn't get from there here to there in 10 minutes, and that's exactly how long it took my pa to get here. They was the longest 10 minutes of his life. He come in this very outhouse. It may not look like much now, but it was the finest outhouse made by man. My grandpappy built it with his own two hands. Pa told me my grandpappy said the devil himself couldn't knock this one over. See, there was a bunch of scalawags around Gladioli. Gladiola, fam, family by the name of Pitt. They gave Pa a terrible time at school. Gave everyone a terrible time. They scared little girls and cheated at games and even tried to burn the school down. They ran roughshod over the whole country, county, tearing down fences so the cows could get loose, helping themselves to everybody's crops and stealing the storekeeper blind. But their favorite trick of all was knocking over outhouses. You might say it was a hobby of theirs. They'd let a person get good and settled inside, then rush up and tip it over. It'd take a while for the victim to crawl out, but the yelling started right away. They did it to Grandpappy late one night, and he was madder than anything. He vowed that it would never happen to him again, so he set to building a tip-proof outhouse. My pa says that everybody thought he'd lost his mind. He let the crops go to seed and hammered on the dang thing night and day. He had a few failures and had to start over, but pa says he was busting with pride when it finished. It was a two-seater with a window, so if there was mischief, Grandpappy could look out and see who the culprits were. He made Pa and his brother try to tip it over. Harder! Push harder, he yelled at them. Well, Pa was 16 and pretty strong, but the old outhouse wouldn't budge. Grandpappy said it was solid as the rock of ages. I don't know if those pits ever tried to tip it over, but if they did, they must have been disappointed. Anyway, Grandpappy and his family would sit in that outhouse with no worry of being tipped again. Then there come a scorcher of a day in August. The air got heavy and still. The sky had a sickly greenish color. Who ever heard of a green sky? Pa felt the call of nature and ducked inside the outhouse. He wasn't sitting there very long when he heard what sounded like a train coming, and it sounded like it was coming right for the outhouse. However, the train didn't even pass near their farm, much less Gladiola. As he was pondering that thought, the outhouse started bumping and bouncing like a bucking bronco. He figured the Pat Pitt family was back again. He held on to the tight held on tight to the seat and waited for the outhouse to tip over, but the banging and the shaking got worse. Just as Pa thought judgment day had come, the outhouse started spinning around like a merry go round at the county fair. He decided to go he decided to look out the window and see how the pits could manage this. He was surprised to see he was surrounded by fluffy white clouds. He wasn't even on the ground no more. He was flying high, smack dab in the middle of a cyclone. He thought he was on his way to heaven, and he'd hoped he'd be able to stay there. So any little bad thing he ever done, a white lie here, a small mistake there, whirled through his mind as he twirled through the clouds. Next, a funny thing happened. The clouds parted, and Pa could look out the window and see what was under him. What he saw was pure amazing. Blue water as far as the eye could see. It was the ocean rolling right under him. Quick as a blink, he was looking down on castles. He must have been over Spain or England. He spun around some more and saw the mountains with the snow on top, the Alpines. Before he knew it, he was over that big wall of China, right next to the famous pyramids of India. He rubbed his eyes, thinking he was dreaming. When he looked down, he was over a big old desert somewhere, and whoosh, he was gazing down at the blue waters again. He spun around faster and faster and higher and higher, and you know what? He was whirling over ice and snow in all directions. There was the North Pole with Sandy Claws waving at him. Pa didn't have a chance to wave back because he twirled his way straight down a big river that was so muddy it had to be the Mississippi. He held on for dear life as the outhouse started jerking and jolting, most shaking his teeth loose. Pa figured this was the end, and while he was preparing himself, the outhouse dropped straight down and hit the ground like a load of bricks. Pa said it got real still, real quiet, quiet as snow falling, quiet as, well, dead quiet. It took a while for him to get up the courage to look out the window. He dang sure didn't know what to expect, but he took a deep breath and looked out and saw this. He had landed on the actual spot all the way from Gladiola Springs, Georgia, clear across the world to Sassafras Springs by way of the, one of the biggest, baddest cyclones to hit the country. He was amused at first. Shucks, who wouldn't be? He wandered outside, kind of ginger-like. He stumbled his way across the creek to the general. To the general. 
Hiram Yount's father run it back then. He called the preacher who listened to the story and let my pa stay at his place for a while. Pa wrote home and got a letter back saying that the cyclone had flattened the house, killing my grandpappy. Grandma and the other youngins were all right, but they'd lost everything. Poor grandpappy Jackson. If he'd built this house like he built his outhouse, he might still be alive today. And that's the story of here, of this here wonder, the outhouse that flew around the world. I looked over at Jeb, Maggie, and Carrie. Their jaws were just sitting on the ground. I guess mine was too. I'd never heard such a story before. Albert stepped forward. You putting that, you putting that down with your wonders, he asked. You got any proof? Albert and Coogie exchanged a quick look. I got proof, said Coogie. You go inside there. You'll see those two seats and next to the window. My pa scribbled a map of what he saw. Dated and signed it right there on the wall. My good sense made me hesitate. There's your proof waiting, said Albert, pointing at the door. Go on. So I went inside and the door slammed behind me. Right away, I noticed something wrong. There was one seat, not two. I turned the window looking, at some, looking for some writing in a map. I realized I'd been about one second before that rickety, rackety, falling down outhouse tipped on its side. I crashed down with it and lay there, listening to Coogie and Albert whooping and hollering outside and jabbing the girls giggling up a storm. I'd been... I had been, and I should have known. I'd been had, and I should have known better. I was probably the only person in Sassafras Springs, except for Violet Rowan, who knew the Great Pyramid was in Egypt, not India, like he'd said. And that thing about Santa Claus waving? Well, like I said, I'd been had. I crawled over to the window, which was way down low to the ground. Go eat some leaves, Coogie Jackson, I shouted. Go eat poison ivy. He kept on laughing, and I didn't blame him. Sal came up to the window, sniffing and whining, but I was in no hurry to get up. I stayed in there, thinking, until the light coming in through the window started to fade. You can come out now. They're gone, I finally heard Jeb say. I crawled through the window. That coogie, I grumbled, brushing spider webs off my clothes. Sorry you got tricked, said Jeb. It was a good whopper, though, don't you think? Yep, but it wasn't a wonder, Jeb snickered. That thing about Santa Claus? That was good. I shook my head. Coogie Jackson would or do would do or say anything. On my way home, I wondered how long it would take me to live the whole thing down. The girls had already told Ray Ellen, no doubt, and Albert wouldn't be shy about spreading the word. I was ready to hop a train to Colorado and never come back. Pa was heading out of the barn when I got back home. Find yourself a wonder, he asked. Nah, just some friends at the, just saw some friends down at the creek. Pa, you know about an old outhouse in the woods? Other side of the creek? I nodded. Built by a fellow, oh, 20 years ago, said Pa. He was a squatter who pitched a tent in the woods and built that outhouse. Pa stared out the barn at the faraway look in his eyes. He seemed like a nice enough fellow until Marvin Peavy found out he was stealing folks' horses and selling them in Oak Grove. The fellow picked up his tent and left in a hurry, but he had to leave his outhouse behind. I can't believe it's still standing. It's not after today. Pa looked over at me, squinting his eyes. You in some kind of trouble? No, I was tricked and tricked good by Coogie Jackson, and I'm never going to live it down, I said. Folks forget over time, Pa said after a long pause. I know some upstanding people who have lived down worse than that. I'm not going to tell you which ones, though. When we got to the porch, Aunt Pretty was sitting in her rocker, but for once, instead of crocheting, she was sewing with a needle and thread, and she wasn't darning socks either. What's that you're making, Pa asked. Well, a boy can't travel on a train in rags and tatters, can he? I'm making Ab Eben a new shirt, and I'm going to take Grandpa's old trousers of the trunk in the attic and cut them down, too. Going to knit him some new shoes, too, Pa asked with a twinkle in his eyes. Aunt Pretty chuckled. If I could, if, could, if I had a mind to it, to do it. I was feeling confused. Aunt Pretty thought you didn't approve of me. Aunt Pretty, I thought you didn't approve of me going. At first, I was vexed, I admit. Sometimes folks go away and don't come back. But I'm pleased for you to take a trip, Evan. I just have my concerns. You seem to have forgotten Cole that no one was too happy when Molly married Eli, him being a complete stranger she'd known about a week. That was 20 years ago, Pa slapped at a mosquito. Guess he's no stranger to Molly anymore. Aunt Pretty's needle darted in and out of the white cloth. Don't even know where those two live, she muttered. Might live in a tent for all we know. A tent would be nice and cool in the summer. Pa gave me a wink. Yes, sir, I might try that sometime. A smile played across Aunt Pretty's lips. Maybe I'd better knit Eben a nice warm sweater, sweater just in case. The conversation was getting under my skin. I haven't gotten seven wonders yet. 
I glanced at Pa. I just wasted a whole afternoon on a joke. Goodness gracious, you have two whole days left, said Aunt Pretty. Now stand up. Let me see if this will fit. She held a cloth against my shoulders and said it'd fit just fine, but I had a strong suspicion I wasn't going anywhere. It was the first day I hadn't actually gotten a wonder, and I was feeling gun-shy about showing myself in public again. I sat down on the first step, on the front step, feeling downright sorry for myself. What good on earth were wonders? Were four wonders. I might as well have gone fishing for four days. Aunt Pretty put down her sewing and excused herself to put supper on the table. She stopped at the door and sniffed the air. Smells like rain coming. High time, said Pa. After a while, the yard took on a purpley look to it. Uh, after a while, the yard took on that purpley look it gets after the sun hit the horizon. Pa stretched inside, and I could tell he was getting ready to go out and do the milking, so I jumped up first and grabbed a lantern. Let me, Pa. I can handle it by myself. Pa looked surprised but pleased. I was pleased, too, since Mert and Mabel were probably the only two females in Sassafras Springs that hadn't heard about the outhouse yet. I was relaxing in the steady splashing of the milk hitting the pail when I heard a rustling noise. Mert looked nervous, and Sal jumped up and ran to the barn door. Standing in the doorway was Trouble herself, Ray Ellen Hubble, carrying a raggedy old burlap bag. What are you doing here? My tone of voice made it clear I wasn't happy to see her. You need another wonderful, so I figured if you're not going to come see me, I'll bring it to you. She raised the burlap sack so I could see it. I sighed. Ray Ellen, I'm milking here. She perched herself on a hay bale and said, I can wait. And wait she did, for Mert was not a cow to be hurried, and neither was Mabel. Just about the time I finished, Pa came out to take the milk buckets. He didn't seem surprised to see Ray Ellen there. He just said howdy and told me he'd have Aunt Pretty hold my supper for me while I entertained my guest. I was about to say that guests were folks you actually invited, but I knew he'd get on me for being rude. Once he was gone, Ray Ellen slid off the hay bale and brought her sack over to me. Do you want to see my wonderful or not? It better be good, I warned her. Ray Ellen led me to the window and carefully opened the bag and reached inside. It's a ship in a bottle. Ray Ellen's voice quivered. My Uncle Dutch gave it to me. I stared at the dusty bottle. The tiny ship inside didn't impress me much. I know how they do it, I bragged. They collapse the boat, stick it in the bottle, and pull it up again with a string. It's a trick, not a wonder. Evan McAllister, are you dumb as a post? This isn't some regular old ship in a bottle. This is a real live ship with a cargo full of pure and terrible evil. Ray Ellen's eyes widened as she paused. Now, are you going to write this down or not? Ah, uh, go on, I said, pulling out my tablet, but make it fast. Ray Ellen's Story, Dark Seas, page 144. Uncle Dutch says that in the summer, he'd watch the waves of corn out in the field, and all he could think about was the ocean and cool water and tropical breezes. As soon as he was old enough, he snuck out of the house and went east, looking for the sea and a job on a ship. He didn't know diddly about ships or sailing, so he had to tell a big fib to get a job as a cabin boy. He went on a great big ship, the SS Phantom of the Sea. A phantom is a ghost, you know. Anyway, the ship was heading for Africa. That's about as far away as you can go. Uncle D Dutch says back in the cornfields he hadn't thought about seasickness and bad food and nasty sailors, and that's what he found there. But he liked the blue waves and the cool breezes, and his belly got used to the ship rocking after a while. The big problem was the captain of the ship. His name was Captain Graves, and he was meaner than old Lady Ellis. She won't even let me take a shortcut through her orchard. Says I stole apples. Anyway, the captain, he kept all the good food and drink locked up for himself while his crew half starved. He treated the, treated the sailors like dirt. Worse than dirt. Worse than you, treat, you boys treat us girls. Uncle Dutch says he was skin and bones after a few weeks, and the whole crew was grumbling about Captain Graves. Well, they reached the tip of Africa, and they were supposed to go all the way around the Cape of something or other. Then the most awfulest, terrible storm hit the, hit the SS Phantom of the Sea. The sailors were scared out of the wits, especially Uncle Dutch. The waves whooshed over the deck. Lightning struck all around them. Finally, the first mate, he's the head sailor, knocked on the captain's door. Captain's grave was mad as all get out that somebody disturbed him because he'd been drinking his expensive liquor from France or some such place. The first mate told him the crew was scared and wanted to sail into a safe harbor for the night. They knew they were close to land. That mean captain cussed him with bad words. I've been real bad, so bad I can't say him. I'm a... I am afraid of nothing on heaven or earth, he said, and he slammed the door in the first mate's face. Bang! 
Uncle Dutch says he prayed for the storm to let up, but it got worse and worser. He hung on to the side of the ship for dear life, and all he could think about were the rows of corn waving in the hot sun. He swore that if he ever got to land safely, he'd never set foot on a ship again. That's what he was thinking when a huge wave crashed across the deck and washed two sailors overboard right before his eyes. The crew sat down, whatchamacallits, life pea servers, to fish them out, but no one ever laid eyes on, on them again. The rest of the crew was wailing like ghosts, which Uncle Dutch says he thought they were soon going to be. Soon they went to the ca back to the captain's cabin, and the first mate knocked. This time, the captain was roaring mad when he opened the door. His eyes were bloodshot, and his breath was hot. Bunch of quivering cowards, he called them, and said that all of them together didn't have the courage of one real man like him. God will not sink my ship. He wouldn't dare, he shouted. And you know, Eben, it's not a good idea to dare the Lord. The sailors were fixing to gather down below to decide what to do. As they walked away from the cabin, they saw something coming toward them, glowing like foxfire out in the piney woods. Oh, it was a horrible thing with fiery red eyes. It walked toward them, and then it walked right through them and on, and on into the captain's cabin without bothering to open the door. It was a ghost, or maybe something even worse. Uncle Dutch says they could hear the captain talking like he was having a conversation, but they could only hear one voice. I want no help. I need no help. Now get off my ship, the, sh the captain shouted. There were three gunshots. Pow, pow, pow. They heard a weird noise like the wind howling. This ship is doomed, and you are doomed to remain on the board for all eternity. Uncle Dutch says that means forever and ever. The words gave my uncle an awful chill. The sailors broke down the door, and they were surprised as they could be to see Captain Graves standing there with his pistol in one hand and an empty bottle in the other. It was the same bottle, Eben, and there was no one else in the room, not a sign of another living soul. There was a crash, boom, and the ship pitched over on its side. Uncle Dutch says he slid right out of the little window called the pothole and over the edge of the ship. The next thing you knew, he was at the, in the water, hanging onto a piece of floating wood. After a while, the clouds lifted and out popped a full moon with a big smiling face. The storm was over. Uncle Dutch says he didn't know how long he floated. Sometime the next day he reached land. He couldn't believe his good luck. He crawled on shore and looked for other signs of life, but he never saw another sailor from that ship again. He spent the day there and that afternoon he found something else that had floated on shore. It was just this bottle and inside the ship, like you see it now, with these letters on the side saying, S.S. Phantom of the Sea, and you'd better believe that, Eben, or you'll be sorry. Uncle Dutch says he wandered for a while until he found a village. Some Englishmen helped him to get a place on the ship coming back home. Since he got back, he never so much as set foot in a canoe. He won't even get in the bathtub. He says nothing makes him happier than a hot summer day, the drier the better. He gave me this bottle because he said he never wanted sight of it again. He told me to take special care of it. Don't ever break it, Ray Ellen, he said. I can't be responsible for what happened. If all that evil got out. Ray Allen stopped talking long enough for me to figure out the story was over. It's a one of a kind wonderful, isn't it? She asked. It's a good story, I said, and it could be wonder. A wonder? I might get to Colorado yet. Colorado? Ray Allen screeched. Well, what do I get? It's my story. What are you going to give me for it? I considered for a moment. I'll give you my pie on the first day of school. At least then she wouldn't have to steal it. First week, she insisted, five whole days. I was in no mood to argue. First week, I agreed, and if I were you, Ray Ellen, I'd take real good care of that bottle, just in case. When we came outside again, it was dark, and Pa insisted on driving Ray Ellen home in the pickup. That was a wonder, because one wasn't, Pa wasn't one to waste gas. In fact, some folks didn't even know he had a truck. He used it so seldom. He made me ride along, but I didn't think of... I didn't think any of us said a word all the way to the Hubble's place. I kept a close eye on that burlap sack. On the way back home, big fat raindrops started plopping on the windshield. Looks like your friend brought us luck, said Pa. I didn't believe that, but I was feeling pretty certain she'd brought me a genuine wonder. <laughs>